So we are so excited to have our very own Dr. Chris DeMeo speaking with us today on the management of large colon polyps. Chris began his training at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia in internal medicine, where he served as chief resident. He then underwent GI fellowship training uptown at Columbia and advanced endoscopy fellowship at MGH and Brigham and Women's Hospitals. He has won numerous research and teaching awards and is a fellow of all the major GI societies, um, including NYSGE. Despite being a busy advanced endoscopist, he's still an author on over 100 articles and reviews and is frequently invited to speak on a multitude of advanced endoscopy topics, including pancreas, EUS, and medical education. He has been at Mount Sinai since 2011 and currently serves as System Director of Interventional Endoscopy. Please join me in welcoming Chris to talk to us about endoscopic management of large colon polyps. Wow, thank you so much. That's a very kind and generous introduction. Um, but I would like to start by thanking uh, the chief fellows and the, and the uh, program directors for inviting me back to give GI Grand Rounds. It's always an honor uh, and privileged to share our work with uh, our colleagues. Um, and I'll just say again, congratulations to all the graduating fellows last night. Uh, we had a wonderful ceremony, made the best that we could. Uh, so congratulations to them. Hopefully some of uh, what I talk about today will be, will, will be put to use in your own practice uh, because this, while this is an, an endoscopic uh, topic, this is something I think we can all use. So um, I am going to speak today a little bit different. Uh, you know, Steve Iskowitz last night was said, oh, good, what pancreas topic are you speaking on? And I said, colon polyps. So, so a little bit uh, out of my usual, uh, out of my usual uh, um, uh, you know, book of things to talk about, but certainly something that uh, I and, and the rest of our group are incredibly passionate about. Uh, and uh, it's actually a quite a satisfying uh, procedure um, and, and it's wonderful when you can, uh, you know, spare a patient in a surgical intervention. And I've, as you see, I've titled it The Optimal Way to Approach Endoscopic Removal. So none of this talk could be possible without the many long-lasting contributions of the uh, true pioneer in endoscopy and colonic polyp resection, uh, Jerry Way. So uh, certainly we tip our cap to Jerry. I know he's, uh, he's watching today. And just so nobody confuses what I mean by the master, this is the person I'm referring to in this slideshow. So we all do colonoscopy every day. We all come across uh, colon polyps every day, and the vast majority of them are quite easy to resect and remove. Uh, and we can debate the proper way to take out small and medium-sized polyps. But occasionally, we come across uh, monster polyps like this. Um, and usually before the scope is removed from the patient, we're uh, scrolling through our iPhones looking for the cell phone of the nearest colorectal surgeon. Uh, well, what I hope to share with you today is that polyps like this uh, should and can and should be attempted uh, for re endoscopic resection uh, as I show you, as I will show you that it is both safe and effective to remove polyps such as this uh, endoscopically. And uh, there have been leaps and bounds in uh, techniques and tools uh, and understanding of diseases since that first colonoscopy back in 1969. And I can envision Jerry back then, uh, you know, presenting one of these polyps at Friday morning conference and asking the crowd, what should I do? Just take it out. And if somebody said surgery, he would emphatically say, nah. By the way, this is Jerry using a, an endoscope to look down uh, a leg cast to see what was causing uh, an itch there. But in the 50 years since uh, Jerry started tinkering around with homemade snares and early prototypes of uh, colonoscopes, again, a lot has changed to the point where now in 2020, we actually have uh, society and uh, multi-society guidelines on how best to assess and manage colorectal polyps based on their size and their morphology. So with that as a little bit of an introduction, my goal today is to present to you an evidence-based approach to the endoscopic management of large colon polyps. And this really means polyps that are two centimeters in size or greater. Again, much of this can be applied to polyps that are less than a centimeter or between one and two centimeters, which I think for the majority of us, that's what we're gonna see. Uh, but I'm really going to focus on the uh, data pertaining to large polyps because I think that's where uh, there's still room to get the word out that endoscopy is a, is a viable uh, intervention. I'll touch on classification systems for lesion assessment, 
review some optimal equipment and accessories. We'll talk about uh, uh, techniques for improving safety and efficacy of removal, and then we'll end on minimizing suboptimal outcomes such as adverse events and recurrence. So there are numerous endoscopic classification systems that we use on a daily basis. Examples would include the LA classification for uh, severity of esophagitis, the PROG classification for uh, describing presence of Barrett's esophagus, uh, and, and as a, most of you uh, use the Mayo uh, classification system or Mayo uh, disease activity score for patients with uh, assessing severity of inflammatory bowel disease. But we do have multiple endoscopic classification systems to use for colon lesions. And the goal of using those classification systems is to one, create that common language among endoscopists so that if your referring physician says this patient has a 2A plus 2C lesion, that's 2.5 centimeters, you can already start thinking about how you're gonna approach that lesion. But really the, the main crux of the classification systems are to stratify which lesions may pose a high risk of containing a cancer and or submucosal fibrosis. The presence of one or both of these may impact your decision as to whether or not that patient should go, undergo surgery or endoscopy. And if you do undergo endoscopy, which would be the optimal endoscopic technique, for example, EMR, or ESD. The most widely utilized classification system is the Paris classification system. Now this was based on a classification system from Japan that was used to describe gastric lesions, where as we know, gastric cancer is highly prevalent. So uh, the, the Paris classification breaks down polyps based on their morphology. So type one, um, and we, we put a zero in front of the numbers to classify that this is not gastric or, or other lesions. So type one are polypoid lesions. So a 1P would be pedunculated and a 1S would be sessile, much like we see every day. Uh, type two lesions are non-polypoid or flat lesions. And that can be subdivided further into 2A, which has minimal elevation, 2B, which are truly flat, and 2C, which have minimal depression. Here are examples of 2A, which is slightly elevated, and you see there 2C, which is depressed. And then type three are ulcerated, uh, you know, with a deep ulceration into the submucosa. Now, when it comes to flat lesions, it's very common that these lesions contain more than one component. And so our descriptor of that uh, is reflective uh, of what kind of components are present. So again, we have a 2A, which is one of the most common uh, descriptors of flat polyps, the, the slight elevation. But you can also have a 2A plus 2C, where you have both flat components and a depressed component. Or another example is the 2A plus 1S, so flat component with a sessile uh, component to it as well. Another way these large polyps are often described is LSTs, or laterally spreading tumors. And again, this refers to the fact that these flat polyps have a very low vertical axis uh, and, their, and their spread is more lateral along the wall as opposed to height, uh, like, like you would think of a building. And LSTs are further subdivided based on their surface morphology or granularity. So you can have an LST that is granular, which is uh, one of like the polyp I showed in the very beginning, very nodular. Or you can have LSTs that are non-granular, which have more of a smooth outline, smooth border, smooth mucosa, no nodularity. Now, when you take this whole group together of LSTs, you can see that many of these contain advanced pathology with submucosal invasion being present in about eight and a half percent and high grade dysplasia being present in about 37%. And, and what I'll show you in a few slides coming is that actually these two lesions have diff very different risks of containing cancer in advanced pathology. We all use NBI on some level, whether it's to see the outline of a polyp or a lesion, uh, or to figure out, am I looking at a polyp or what kind of polyp am I looking at? Uh, so fortunately we have uh, an NBI international classification uh, system or the NICE classification which uh, is dependent on looking at the color of the polyp, the color and morphology of the vessels and surface pattern, and that helps uh, determine what is the most likely pathology that you see. So for example, uh, 
polyps that have a lighter color than the background with very scant uh, vessels um, and the absence of very dark spots are more likely to be hyperplastic or sessile serrated. Whereas uh, where you have a browner polyp with uh, vessels surrounding oval or tubular structures, that's more typical of an adenoma. And when you start to talk about vessel disruption and disorganized patterns with dark features on NBI, uh, now you're thinking about submucosal invasive cancer. Similarly, there is something called the Kudo pit pattern, which is a chromoendoscopy based classification system, which more or less apes what I spoke about on the previous slide. The most important take home about the Kudo pit pattern uh, is Kudo 5. That is also a regular arrangement of the uh, surface pattern and the vessel pattern uh, or loss of uh, an identifiable pattern altogether, both of which are uh, associated with the presence of invasive cancer. So this is a very uh, nice study by the Australian Colonoscopy Group, or the ACE Group, uh, which is a prolific uh, academic uh, multi-center uh, endoscopic group out of Australia, where they've done some amazing prospective studies uh, looking at uh, large colon poly polypectomy and discerning features, outcomes, and, and optimal techniques. Uh, and what they did, this is a prospective study of over 200 polyps, uh, all greater than two centimeters. And they tried to identify which lesion characteristics are associated with the presence of cancer. So for example, uh, if you use the Paris classification, we see in this group that, that there were uh, 222 were 2A lesions, but the presence of submucosal invasion, the, the percentage was actually quite low. So most of those 2A lesions, those bumpy nodular uh, flat lesions are benign. But if you have a depressed component, 2C, or a flat and depressed, 2A plus 2C, even though it's not as common, it made up less than 5% of the cohort, cancer or, or high-grade dysplasia was present in about a third of those cases. If you use the surface morphology classification, granular versus non-granular, again, these granular lesions are very ugly looking. Sometimes they can be hemicircumferential or circumferential, and they're very common, about two-thirds of, of of uh, lesions that are, gran are, are granular, but very, very small chance or percentage actually have invasive cancer. Whereas the non-granular type, that smooth surface, much higher risk of having cancer. And then similarly with that KUDO pattern, that five pattern, more than half of uh, the lesions in this series had cancer. Not to belabor, but taking it, uh, just, just hammering home this point, um, again, if you see these bumpy, granular, nodular, laterally spreading tumors, those are very prevalent uh, in patients who have advanced mucosal neoplasia, but the risk of cancer there is very small. So when you see a lesion like this, you can say, ah, this looks like a good lesion for endoscopic resection. Granular lesions with a nodular component, also quite common, a uh, little higher risk of submucosal invasion. Uh, but still acceptable, and you would use best clinical judgment as to whether or not to resect. Once you get into that non-granular uh, or the non-granular with, with the depressed lesion, again, this is a minority of cases, but you can see that the prevalence of advanced uh, pathology, particularly invasive cancer, is quite high. And here are some examples. So a Paris 2A granular, this was a benign tubulovillus adenoma, Whereas this was a 2A plus 1S with the, um, with the, with the uh, sessile component, it had more advanced pathology, TVA with a high-grade dysplasia. Here we see a 2A but non-granular, also advanced pathology, high-grade dysplasia. And then this is a 2A plus 2C, uh, non-granular, and as predicted by the previous slide, this had invasive adenocarcinoma. This was a patient that was referred to me for endoscopic removal of this lesion. Uh, I remember Jerry walked into the room and I said, what do you think of this? And he said, oh, that's an adenocarcinoma. So he was absolutely correct. This is a 2A plus 2C lesion. You see this depression right here. You see the loss of vascularity and uh, organized pattern on NBI. And uh, you know, not surprisingly, when you try to inject it, it doesn't lift. And this did prove, that, prove to be a very small, about a, about a 15 millimeter uh, cancer that was cured with surgical resections. 
So now you've found your large lesion, uh, and now you say, okay, this lesion is appropriate for endoscopic resection. How do I approach this? What are the appropriate tools to use this? And again, we know we, we always need the right tools in our toolbox to do the job both safely and effectively. And again, in the past 50 years, we've come a very long way from those handmade snares that Jerry used uh, or those Valley Lab uh, cautery, uh, cautery uh, processors, which basically just pumped electrical energy without any control or feedback uh, through the snare. Uh, but when you're talking about removal of large polyps, you really need the right tools. And that includes things such as a microprocessor controlled electrosurgical generator, we always use CO2 insufflation. I'll talk a little bit about types of injectates. We always want to use an inert dye, such as indigo carmine or methylene blue. You need to use the right scope, and that depends on the patient's anatomy and the location of the polyp. I'll talk a little bit about the use of distal attachments or caps. I'll spend some time talking about the importance of types of snares to use. And you also need tools for retrieval of specimen and dealing with adverse events. So we all know and we all use injectates on a daily basis. And again, I don't have to tell this group that the purpose of the injectate is to lift the lesion and create a fluid cushion between the mucosa and the muscularis propria. And this serves a number of purposes. Uh, it allows us to inadvertently uh, resect deep into the muscle. So we're getting uh, mucosa and submucosa without uh, making a big hole in the, or perforation in the muscularis. This also, this fluid cushion also acts to dissipate some of the thermal energy that we're applying. And again, minimizes the risk of a transmural thermal injury to that muscle, which again, can lead to a delayed perforation. The other point of using an injectate is to help delineate uh, the, the borders of your lesion. So again, I think all of you have experienced this. You come across this very subtle lesion, uh, typical for an SSA. You use NBI, uh, but when you start injecting it with a dye agent, you start to see that the lesion is actually quite larger uh, than you initially intended. And also you get a very nice outline of where the borders are to allow you to resect and get clean margins. There are all different types of injectates one can use. Uh, many of the societies are now suggesting that one consider using a more viscous solution uh, such as head of starch or hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, which is what artificial tears are. There's even been reports of people using autologous blood, so taking a blood sample from a patient and using that to inject underneath the polyp to lift it. And the idea behind uh, using a more viscous solution is that uh, your cushion won't dissipate as quickly, um, and it allows you to maintain that cushion uh, and minimize having to go back in and keep injecting. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard of this new product out called Eleview. Eleview is commercially available. Uh, it is a proprietary synthetic copolymer mixed with methylene blue. It comes in these 10 ml syringes. And when you inject that substance into the submucosa, it binds with biopolymers in our submucosa, and it creates something called a molecular net that basically holds fluid in this net and prevents it from migrating out of your injection site or dissipating into the submucosa. Uh, so this was a randomized double-blind trial uh, of large colon polyps who, and patients were randomized to either a lift with just saline alone uh, with methylene blue or Eleview. Large polyps in this series, and what they found was that the Eleview arm uh, required lower volumes of injectate. It actually took shorter time to resect the lesions in fewer number of pieces and they actually had a higher on-block resection rate. So interesting outcomes, uh, and there was no difference in adverse events. So this is commercially available. The one, the one downside to it is that each vial costs about $45, and these are sold in packs of 10. So pretty high cost, uh, but some would argue that shorter times and fewer pieces is worth that cost. How about the use of epinephrine? Um, there's surprisingly not a whole lot of data on this. So this was one prospective study where patients were randomized to getting a polyp lift with either epinephrine, dilute epinephrine, or saline. Interestingly, there was no difference in rates of early bleeding or late bleeding uh, when you used epinephrine compared to saline. 
Uh, so this is not really part of common practice. Now, many people, myself included, do use a little bit of epinephrine, uh, and my solution is to take a 250 ml bag of saline, uh, put one ml of one in 10,000 epinephrine in that bag of 250 of saline, and then put methylene blue in there. Uh, and that's my solution that I use. And I justify using that small bit of epinephrine because anecdotally, I feel and I've experienced that I get less intraprocedural bleeding um, compared to uh, if I just use saline alone. Uh, but I do believe this data that using epinephrine has no outcomes on whether or not the patient has a delayed bleed later on. Moving on to snares. This is probably uh, the most important tool that we need uh, when properly trying to take out these large polyps. Uh, the, the typical classic thin wire snare that I think is available in every endoscopy room really is inadequate on taking out large polyps. The reason is they're very floppy and you cannot get a good purchase on the lesion. When you use these braided snares, which is basically two wires braided together, um, and they come in various shapes and sizes, uh, what you'll see, and I'll show in some of the videos, is that these snares uh, don't pop up. It allows you to really grab the back edge of that polyp and provide a very stable and firm grasp on the tissue, which is very important, especially with flat lesions. Uh, we all like uh, in our group to use distal attachments or clear caps. Uh, and what this does is that it allows you to push aside folds. So if your polyp is behind a fold, you can use the, um, you can use the uh, cap to push it aside. So here's one example. Uh, this was a very large polyp and we couldn't see the base of it on where to inject. So you see this clear cap, which really does not impede your view. It never hurts you but just this few millimeters of cap sticking out allows us to push this polyp away, expose the base, uh, and allow for a safe uh, and non, and, and, and basically an unblind injection. The other area when it comes to colon polyp removal uh, that is, uh, remains of great debate is that of the use of microprocessor controlled electrosurgical generators. So I think all of us grew up, and, and this again is based on Jerry's teaching, of using that blue pedal to do coagulation. Um, when you use a microprocessor, uh, what that allows is a controlled tissue cut. And it actually is a pretty amazing uh, piece of equipment because it blends both cutting and coagulation currents at the same time. And these processors are quite smart because as you're cutting and coagulating, you're creating dry desiccated tissue that increases the resistance of that of current to go through that tissue, something called impedance. And these processors will sense that level of impedance through the snare. And if it sees that you're, you need higher energy to cut through this now dry tissue, it'll up the power automatically uh, and prevent you from having to, you know, continuously provide low consistent burning, which may uh, ultimately escape to the deeper levels of tissue the muscle and cause complications. So we all know what this looks like. This is the Irby generator. And I think this, the, the blue side, the blue pedal is what we're all used to. This is just forced coagulation, uh, basically just coagulates tissue. And it really doesn't have any cutting current at all. You're kind of cold snaring through this dry tissue as you're coagulating it. The other side though, the yellow pedal, which probably most of you are afraid to step on, is the blended current, something called endocut Q. And it has three different settings, the main one being the effect. This effect can be one, two, three, or four. The higher the number, the more the coagulation effect. So an effect one would be pure cutting. Uh, but you can also uh, control the duration of the cut and the interval between cutting currents. And this is what I was talking about, this blended current. So when you step on this yellow pedal, the first, the, the first uh, uh, part of the energy that is delivered is an actual uh, blend of both cut, cut, cutting and coagulation. So the first energy that tissue sees is cut coag, cut coag, cut coag, cut coag to provide a little bit of coagulation. Then it goes into a cut mode. Then it goes into a coagulation mode and then it repeats that cycle. And this is all happening in the span of microseconds. It's, it's quite amazing. 
And there are pros and cons to using blue and yellow. And again, the debate rages on. There's actually a hot off the presses study, which I'll review at the end. So again, when you use forced coagulation, uh, the, the temperature is low and it ends, it ends up um, uh, evaporating the fluid that's within cells. The cells dry up, desiccate, and this allows you to heat seal blood vessels. And the immediate effect is that it reduces the risk of intraprocedural or early bleeding. The problem is you get this eschar that forms, much like if you skinned your knee, and just like if you skinned your knee and you pick at that scab one, one week later, you'll re-bleed, the same thing can happen with colon polyps. So you can have delayed bleeding with forced coagulation, which can occur up to two weeks after. The other risk of forced coagulation uh, is that there is a higher risk of transmural deep tissue injury, which can predispose the patient to a perforation. Blended current, on the other hand, encompasses this cut mode, and the temperature with a cut mode is much higher, so you actually vaporize the cells. Uh, this doesn't cause any uh, drying or coagulation, so there is theoretically a higher risk of immediate bleeding or intraprocedural bleeding. But what the advantages of a blended current are, are that you get these clear surgical-like margins. There's virtually no char. Uh, and it avoids deep burn into the tissue, which reduces your risk of post-polypectomy syndrome, decreases the risk of perforation. So when you're faced with a large polyp, and I think we all have, and not just at Mount Sinai, but, but across the country and the world, there is a debate, are, are you a yellow petal guy or a blue petal guy? And most of my career, I was a blue petal guy, and I had a rash of delayed bleed. Um, patients who would have significant bleeds uh, one to two weeks after removing a polyp. They would be hospitalized, they would need blood transfusions, and they would need um, uh, repeat co urgent colonoscopies. And I made a slow transition, and, and now I would say for the past five years, I'm purely a yellow petal guy uh, with endocut for most of my polypectomies. So let's move on to the actual technique. So uh, as I mentioned, now that we have growing evidence on uh, all of these tools and techniques, uh, there are society and expert guidelines on how best to perform polypectomy. Uh, so the European guideline states that the goals of an EMR are to achieve a completely snare-resected lesion in the safest minimum number of pieces with adequate margins and without the need for adjunctive ablative techniques. Uh, the recently released US Multi-Society Task Force similarly says that the goal is really snare resection of all grossly visible tissue in one session. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the nuances of this. So when it comes down to it, again, this all comes down to the master and understanding how to resect colon polyps the proper way. So the, you can always think of Jerry in your head when you're approaching a polyp. So what does he always tell us? That the scope should be in a relaxed, ideally straight and stable position. We always want the lesion at the six o'clock position because that is where our devices are going to come out of the scope. And sometimes you have to reposition the patient to eliminate the pooling of fluid over the lesion. When you start an injection, you wanna start at the proximal edge of the lesion with the goal of lifting the lesion towards the colonoscope. And when you resect, you wanna start with the most difficult location first, if possible, it's not always possible. You wanna to try to get a two to three millimeter margin of normal mucosa. And once you resect, you wanna use the cut edge of the defect to uh, continue resecting in a contiguous fashion. So here's an example of piecemeal EMR. See, I'm using a stiff snare. It's rotatable, the assistant can rotate it. And what I'm going to do, and you'll notice in all the videos I show, I'm always gonna push the tip of the catheter to the base of the polyp before I close that snare. Because wherever the tip of the catheter is, that is where, whoops, that is where my snare is gonna end up closing to. The other thing you'll notice is when I pull the snare to me, the whole wall is not coming, it's just the polyp. And that's a very important thing to see because if the whole wall was coming to me, that means I've probably grabbed muscle and I don't wanna make that cut. But now I've made my cut, I see nice blue submucosa. I'm gonna re-inject. So it's a series of, of snaring and re-injecting. And again, I'm gonna use this nice, beautiful cut edge 
as the, as the border of my next resection. I'm going to push the tip of the catheter against the base of the polyp. I'm going to close and I'm going to resect. And my rule is not to get greedy. I rather use a small snare, taking small pieces and taking my time rather than trying to get greedy with a big snare and trying to take these things out all at once. And you see, you get this nice, beautiful resection and I'm using endo cut and you can just see the nice, you'll see in the next video, the nice clear margin. And again, this is from that Australian group. They use this technique and they take out these massive polyps. Look at these resection lines. They use, they tend to use a very low coagulation effect. So they get, it's almost scalpel like, it's amazing. And they do these circum, I don't really know what happens in Australia, but they get these, a lot of these circumferential polyps. Uh, and again, they do these amazing resections uh, that are surgical like. So a lot of times, or many times, you can't always get all of the tissue in your main part of your piecemeal resection, and you may have visible residual polyp. And again, based on the guidelines and the evidence, our goal really should be to resect that uh, and not ablate it. And we can resect it a number of ways. We can use cold biopsies or cold snares. We can continue to use the hot snare. We can use something called hot biopsy avulsion, which I'll show you. But what we want to avoid doing, and I know Jerry is cringing right now, we want to avoid blasting those residual little bits of polyp with APC. So here's what I'm talking about. This is the same polyp that I was removing. So we see these little islands of adenoma at the resection site. And I'm using the same snare and I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna open the snare a little bit. I'm gonna push the tip of the catheter to the base of the polyp. I'm gonna get a nice normal resection margin around that lesion. And I'm gonna do again, hot uh, snare, uh, resection. Again, I'm using endocut, yellow petal. And you can do this with blue petal as well. As you'll see, it really doesn't matter. Again, I'm taking all these little bits out. It would be very tempting to just take the APC and just blast away at this. But as I'll show you, that's suboptimal. Perhaps the most frustrating is when you get these little one millimeter and smaller islands like this. We always say, give me a three centimeter polyp, not a three millimeter polyp, because these can be very challenging to remove. But again, I can still use the same technique to remove these little bits of uh, island. And again, you'll see a beautiful resection, clean resection margin with no visible uh, adenoma present. In some cases, uh, there is not possible to snare off these pieces, uh, particularly if the polyp has had prior intervention say a in prior incomplete attempt at polypectomy where there's a lot of fibrosis. In those cases, uh, again, the goal is to resect that tissue and not ablate it. And this is the newest uh, tool in our armamentarium, something called hot biopsy avulsion. So this is using a hot biopsy forceps, but we're gonna use the yellow petal and use a cutting current to basically peel the tissue off. So again, cutting, it's a cutting uh, and resection uh, maneuver. The technique is that we're going to grab the tissue, we're going to apply mechanical traction, and we're going to use short bursts of yellow petal and cutting current. And again, the main use of this is for residual fragments after a large EMR, uh, or you can use this in tough to reach places that in, in areas that traditionally don't lift very well, such as the IC valve or appendiceal orifice. Most commonly though, we tend to use it when there's adherent polyp left over after fibrosis or submucosa. So this was a patient that was referred to me uh, and the referring physician said, I found this huge polyp in, the, uh, in one of the flexures, but don't worry, I took half of it out. So the rest of it should be easy for you. <clears throat> and I sort of groaned to myself and I said, boy, you did not help my cause at all. And you'll see why. You can just already see that there's all this uh, fibrotic tissue. It's not lifting. We know this is benign based on morphology and prior pathology. So now I'm going to use that hot biopsy avulsion technique uh, to cut away at this tissue. So I'm going to grab, tense, and pull as I step on the yellow petal. And you see, once I peel that tissue away, I'm exposing that nice blue submucosa. I'm not ripping into muscle. I'm not causing a perforation. And you can do this right not only at the edge, you can do this right in the resection bed itself. This is very safe, again, because we're using a cutting current the risk of causing a deep tissue injury is much lower than if I was using this with a blue petal, which would have a very high risk of causing deep tissue burn. And I keep saying, don't use APC, don't use APC, 
use avulsion, and we actually have data to support the, that, uh, that statement. So this was a prospective study of over 200 lesions, all large, and they, they randomized patients uh, who underwent piecemeal EMR to having either avulsion used to get rid of the residua versus APC. And when they looked at the recurrence rate at follow-up, those patients who had EMR plus APC ablation of the visible residual tissue almost a 60% recurrence rate at follow-up, whereas those who underwent EMR plus avulsion of the visible leftover tissue, only 10% with no difference in adverse events. What is the outcome of all of this? I'm showing you all these large polypectomies. How safe and how effective is it? Uh, so these are two of, the, two of the bigger studies. This was a meta-analysis of over 6,000 lesions. The technical success rate was 90% very low 30-day mortality, and the risk of needing surgery from a complication related to EMR, only 1%, very acceptable risk. Uh, again, that Australia group, um, very nice prospective studies, 500 lesions, all large, complete excision uh, for the group was 89%. Uh, when they broke it down, uh, lesions that were treatment naive that hadn't been touched before, 91%. Uh, success rate, but in lesions that had a prior intervention, meaning excessive biopsies had been taken, or a tattoo was placed under the lesion, or a partial polypectomy was attempted, much, le much lower success rate, but still extremely high. So what would make uh, you to likely fail at an EMR or to have a recurrence of tissue after an EMR? Uh, so this is a very nice, again, from that large prospective uh, Australian study, uh, they show that the strongest uh, factor that impacts a failed single session EMR is if that polyp had a prior intervention. And then for as far as recurrence goes, uh, size was uh, the biggest risk factor in determining whether or not there would be recurrent adenoma. But again, the use of APC to ablate visible residual tissue also was extremely high risk. And why is that? Well, APC is not a, when you use APC, you're not getting a uniform ablative effect. Um, as you know, the APC, uh, whether you're close or far, determines how wide an ablation zone you're getting. The edges of the ablation zone tend to get less of an ablative effect, more superficial compared to the central part of the ablation zone. So when you go from spot to spot to spot, you're not really assuring that that patient is getting a uniform ablation of all those pieces that you're ablating. And for more visible tissue, uh, the effect is even greater because you're not ablating microscopic tissue, you're ablating visible residual. Uh, and again, if you're not having a, a complete ablative effect there, there's always gonna be leftovers. So that's why we try not to use it. So what not to do? So this is practical advice for all of you. Do not start an EMR if you're unsure if you can complete it at that session. Do not ablate with APC large areas of residual or unresected polyp. Do not take excessive biopsies if you're not gonna take the polyp out. You can take one or two biopsies in suspect areas. You don't need to take five or 10. Do not, do not, do not inject tattoo within the lesion or underneath the lesion. Basically, all of these practices will result in significant submucosal fibrosis and, again, make the endoscopist job much more difficult and much less successful at resecting uh, that polyp. And then, again, do not send large complex polyps to a surgeon, and I know there's surgeons in the audience, uh, before that patient has had an evaluation by an expert endoscopist at a tertiary center, because as I'll show you, the majority of these lesions can be safely removed endoscopically. We do have advanced resection techniques for patients with uh, defiant polyps that are very fibrotic or even for patients with early cancer. Uh, one of these techniques is called endoscopic full thickness resection. So this is an offshoot of the bear claw clip. Uh, it's actually uh, developed and produced by the Ovesco company. Uh, and what this is is a contraption that combines the use of an over the scope Ovesco clip with a retraction device and what this allows you to do is capture, uh, clip, and cut a lesion all in the same setting, all at the same time. And you can use this for lesions up to about two centimeters. So what you do is you have your cap with the bear claw um, fitted on the end of the scope, 
you grab your lesion with this large uh, mouth grasping forceps, you pull that lesion, not just the lesion, but the entire colon wall up into the cap above where that clip is. So you have mucosa, submucosa, muscle, and serosa. And you, what you're doing is you're clamping off that defect and cutting simultaneously at the same time. So here's an example. You mark your lesion, you grab the tissue, pull it up into the cap, and here's what it looks like after it's cut. This is muscle, serosa, and fat. And you, have, you now have a surgical specimen with uh, the same deep vertical margins as if a surgeon did a wedge resection of this lesion. Uh, the initial data from Europe where this uh, was first released showed a very high technical success rate um, and in patients with difficult adenomas, again, a very high success rate uh, that was in these were lesions that were not amenable to standard EMR techniques. Uh, there are some adverse events, as you would imagine, perforation being one of them, interestingly, appendicitis being one of them, uh, but the rate of needing surgery related to this is still very low. Endoscopic submucosal dissection we're all familiar with, and we know this has revolutionized uh, the removal of early cancers everywhere in the GI tract, esophagus, stomach, duodenum, and colon and rectum. And this can also be utilized in the colon. And again, depending on where the lesion is, uh, or not so much depending on where the lesion is, but you can resect and on block these massive lesions. Uh, and, and the fact that you have an on block resection is if that it's equivalent to surgery. You have lateral margins and vertical margins, and your pathologist can tell you if you have a complete resection. There are numerous platforms that have been released that assist in uh, endoscopic resection, particularly ESD. Uh, this is one system called the Dilumen system, which is an over tube uh, that has two balloons. And uh, when, you inf when you advance the over tube to the uh, lesion, you inflate these two balloons and you create this working space between the two balloons. What this does is that the balloons allow you to maintain insufflation. It also prevents the inflow of, uh, of effluent and other uh, solid and liquid stool uh, that may interfere with your resection. Uh, so this provides you with a stable quote unquote surgical field to do your endoscopic resection. Uh, there's another uh, variant of this called the O-Rise tissue retractor system which not only has a similar hood, which provides uh, maintenance of insufflation and blockage of stool and effluent, but it also has these uh, pretty cool grasping forceps that allows you to grab tissue as if you had your own hands in there and tent and lift the tissue to allow you to do a nice submucosal dissection and get in that space. So there's always a debate, the debate rages on, which is it better to do EMR or ESD? Is piecemeal polypectomy really good for these large benign lesions? Well, EMR has its advantages. It's a very common technique with readily accessible tools. It has a proven track record of safety and efficacy for piecemeal EMR with an acceptable cost. But ESD has been shown that you're always gonna get a higher rate of on-block resection which um, allows you to assess your lateral and deep margins. And ultimately, because you have a higher rate of on-block resection, you're gonna have lower recurrence rates. This all comes at a cost though. This comes at a price of specialized training. Many people, you know, there aren't too many programs. I'm proud to say that our program is one of them and the Keel trains all of our advanced fellows in this technique uh, if they desire it. But some, a lot, many people have to go over to Japan to learn this technique. The procedure times can be very long, often and not uncommon, they can be many hours. Uh, there's clearly the potential for severe adverse events, and it's costly. Uh, the devices are not inexpensive, and if your patient gets admitted after an ESD, uh, again, that's gonna ramp up the cost. So really in 2020, I think where most of us are employing ESD in the resection of large colorectal neoplasia is for those lesions where it's suspected that they, uh, they have a high risk of suspected cancer or there's a proven early cancer, and in patients who may not be good surgical candidates who have advanced neoplasia. The last segment over the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I'll go over optimizing outcomes. How can we prevent adverse events and how can we prevent recurrence? So we should all be familiar with what a perforation looks like or what a deep tissue injury looks like. And this is something called a target sign. 
Uh, and what you're seeing here is this is the resected polyp. When you see this white ring, uh, which looks like a target sign, uh, looks like the target logo, uh, what this is is muscle. And that's not a good thing. And oftentimes you may see this. You may see this big defect with fat and serosa or you know, peritoneum on the other side of it. So when you see this muscle or this ring sign or target sign, you know that you're at, your patient's at risk for perforation. You should not panic, but you should definitely try to clip close that defect. Bleeding is the biggest bugaboo more than perforation. Bleeding can occur during the procedure or more commonly can occur after the procedure. Intraprocedural bleeding occurs about 11% of the time. Uh, interestingly, it has the, the factors that are associated with it, um, increased lesion size, uh, a Paris 2A plus 1F lesion, if there's advanced histology, but really the strongest uh, risk factor for intraprocedural bleeding is experience. So they've found that practitioners who, do less, who, do less than, who have done less than 75 EMRs have a much higher rate of intraprocedural bleeding. And the impact of this is that it can lead to longer procedure times, and higher early recurrence because many times uh, people often stop after they have an intraprocedural bleed uh, and they can't resect the rest of that polyp. We now have coagulation graspers that we can use to uh, stop bleeding, uh, but the latest kit on the block is something called snare tip soft coagulation. So this is a technique where you use the same snare that you're using to uh, resect your lesion uh, and you, what you do is you extend the snare tip just one or two millimeters out of the sheath. There is a dedicated setting for uh, snare tip soft coag. Uh, it's a monopolar effect. And what you're going to do is just gently touch the snare tip to the bleeding site with the blue petal for coagulation. And again, uh, the advantage here is that you're using a soft coag. This isn't forced coag. Uh, this is soft coag where the voltage that is applied to that tissue is fixed. So it's virtually impossible once you get a cauterized area, it's virtually impossible to have a deep tissue burn when you use soft coag. Not the same with forced coag. So you can't use, but if you're using the blue petal to cut your polyp off, you can't use that energy to cauterize a bleeding lesion. You're gonna cause a perforation. You need to switch to STSC. Here's an example of that. So this is a, a granular Paris 2A lesion. Uh, again, low risk for cancer. We're going to start our injection for piecemeal resection. Again, using a stiff snare, not going to get greedy. Going to push my catheter tip to the base of the polyp before I close. Going to get a clear resection margin. You can already see the bleeding is starting. And then after doing a couple of uh, piece, re piece resections, you see that we encounter uh, some intraprocedural bleeding. So now I'm going to use the same snare. I'm going to uh, ex expose one to two millimeters of the snare tip, switch to snare tip soft coag mode, and I'm just going to use this like I would a bipolar probe or any other kind of cautery device. Uh, you don't have to apply a lot. You don't have to sit there and burn it, but you can see in just a few taps, we stop the bleeding. Delayed bleeding, again, I think in my personal experience, this has been my most frustrating uh, adverse event, uh, occurs in about 6% of patients. And we know that there are very real associations associated with delayed bleeding. Probably the strongest one is proximal location. So lesions that are in the cecum, ascending colon, and hepatic flexure are at a much higher risk of a delayed bleed compared to left-sided lesions or transverse colon lesions. Uh, not using a microprocessor or having intraprocedural bleeding also is associated with a higher risk of delayed bleeding. Interestingly, the lesion size or, or patient comorbidities, including the use of anticoagulants, has no association with higher risk of delayed bleeding. And I think this is what everybody is probably most interested in hearing is, well, what is the role of clipping a defect after you remove a large colon polyp? Uh, and what we now have is uh, level one evidence, pros prospective randomized controlled trials, looking at whether or not there is any benefit to clip closing an endoscopic defect after removing a large colon polyp. So these are recently published. Uh, you recognize many of the names led by Heiko Pohl out of Dartmouth and Doug Rex. Uh, almost a thousand patients with non-pedunculated, so sessile and flat polyps, randomized to getting either clips or no clips after their polypectomy uh, 
and the primary outcome was post-procedure bleeding uh, within 30 days. Overall, the use of CLIPS had a significant reduction in the rate of post-polypectomy bleeding, almost basically in half. But when you break it down into subgroups, that was mostly driven by a significant reduction in bleeding from proximal polyps. That, that benefit did not uh, exist in distal polyps. It was really only limited to proximal polyps. The median number of clips required for complete closure was four. The time to bleeding event, if you did not get a clip, was one day, where if you did have a delayed bleed with clips, it was seven days. The effect of clip closure was independent of both the polyp size or use of antithrombotics. And again, proximal colon location was the only factor associated with reduction of bleeding with clip. The number needed to treat was pretty high, 16. Similar study out of Spain, 225 patients, primary outcome delayed bleeding. They did not find in the intention to treat analysis, they, did, they, did, they found a very significant reduction or a, a, a large reduction in rate of delayed bleeding, but that did not reach statistical significance. What they did show, and this is in the per patient analysis, was that there was a major benefit in using CLIPS when you achieved complete closure. So if you have one of these large defects and you're only able to partially close it with two or three CLIPS and leave the other half of it open, there was no benefit. You, you did not have a lower rate of, of delayed bleeding. But when you achieved complete closure, the rate of, of delayed bleeding was significantly lower. Now, only 50% of uh, lesions in that series were only able to undergo a complete closure, and they needed a median number of six clips to uh, achieve complete closure. Again, number needed to treat, 16. We have all different clip options. Uh, they, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Many of them are rotatable. Some of them have short stems after you deploy them. Some of them have long stems. There are a lot of unanswered questions when it co comes to clipping. Uh, we don't really know how close they need to be together, how much tissue to grab. Is one design or manufacturer better than another? We don't really know the retention rates. Some of these clips fall off in days. Some of them you go back in six months and they're still there. We don't know if size makes a difference. We don't know if it's better to use bear claw clips or endoscopic suturing. What is the cost effectiveness of all this? Like one clip costs about $150. So right there, if you're using four to six clips to close a defect, uh, you're upping the cost of your procedure. Now, many would argue that you're saving the patient from another hospitalization, blood transfusions, and a repeat colonoscopy, and that cost is worth it. But I think what these studies show is that, at the very least, large defects in the right colon should be used. And then lastly, and this was an amazing study that I think all of us were waiting to hear, should we use yellow or blue? This was always the million dollar question and everyone had each, there were two camps. Uh, and this was again, that same group of, of experts, Heiko Pohl, Doug Rex, about a, almost a thousand patients with large polyps were randomized to either endocut or forced coagulation. There was no difference in the rate of severe adverse events or recurrence. So if you're a blue petal person, Go for it and continue doing it. You've heard about this cold snare, cold polypectomy revolution. So there's a new camp of people that say, well, yellow or blue, it doesn't matter. You're using heat energy and, and, that, and that energy is where all of your adverse events come from. Why can't we just cold snare all of these polyps and avoid all of the problems related to delivering energy to the tissue? And there are, there are many studies. Could somebody mute their... Uh, their uh, screen, please. Uh, there are a number of studies looking at the benefits of cold snare EMR, and the early studies show that this is associated with safety and efficacy, uh, and again, no delayed bleeding. So um, we are one of, uh, someone needs to mute their, their line there. Um, we are part of a prospective study that will launch soon, uh, where patients will be randomized to hot polypectomy versus cold polypectomy. Uh, and that's uh, one of the that's out of uh, Doug Rex's group. So we're, we're excited to be part of that. Yeah, yeah, nice. Oh. Queen, soft and Queen. Asher, Asher, can you mute your uh, line, please? Last few slides: surveillance. So usually, after we do a piecemeal EMR of more than two centimeters, we bring the patient back for first surveillance at six months. If there's no residual polyp there, we usually repeat it one year and then at three years. If they do have residual or recurrent lesions, again, we like to resect by EMR or avulsion. 
Uh, we can consider ablating the resection site after we've removed all the residual tissue, and those patients usually get a closer surveillance once they've had recurrence or residual lesion. Recurrence occurs about 12% of the time, or residual adenoma occurs about 12% of the time, recurrence about a quarter of the time. Not surprisingly, these are the risk factors, piecemeal resection and size, again, use of APC, uh, and the other factors that I spoke about earlier. One uh, method that is making its way into the mainstream is that after you've completely resected your polyp, uh, you can use that same snare tip soft coag uh, to ablate the resection margin. And again, this is not to ablate visible tissue, but to ablate potential microscopic tissue uh, that you cannot see. So again, we're using that same snare tip soft coagulation uh, of the resection margins. This is that same polypectomy I've been showing uh, from the beginning of the talk here. And we are actually, uh, this is actually being studied uh, in a prospective study that we, that is led by Doug Rex. And again, our group is uh, participating in it where patients who have polyps that are undergoing EMR, two centimeters or greater, patients are being randomized to either no ablation of the resection site versus snare tip ablation of the resection site versus APC. Uh, so we're very uh, uh, interested, and we're one of the, I think we're the second highest recruiting center uh, of all the multi-center, of all the, the groups in the multi-center study. So very excited about the outcomes of that. Here is the most recently published uh, study looking at the use of STSC to ablate, ablate the resection margin. Again, significant reduction in at the time of follow-up of both endoscopic and histologic recurrence. So again, this may soon become the standard of care. Last slides, what about surgery for benign colon polyps? Uh, not, it, somewhat surprisingly, there's been an increase in the rate of surgery for benign lesions over the past two decades. This always blows my mind when people like Jerry have been touting these techniques for decades. It always blows my mind when uh, GIs, especially in the New York region, uh, send patients to a surgeon uh, for uh, consideration of a colectomy. Uh, what we know is that surgical outcomes are good. Uh, there are post-operative uh, adverse events, uh, but endoscopic resection has uh, much better 30-day mortality, and I would argue that the post-op adverse events are less severe and less life-threatening. Uh, there are some series look compare, trying to compare outcomes from the two. These are both retrospective. So this is uh, about 200 patients with complex colon polyps that underwent initial endoscopic evaluation. EMR was able to be performed in 79% and it was deferred in 21%. Uh, similarly, in, in this study, uh, for the EMR group, surgery was recommended in about 19%, so same group. Uh, there was no difference in adverse events between EMR and surgery, but the cost associated with EMR was significantly, significantly lower. So I think in this day and age, uh, at a tertiary center. I know a lot of our colorectal surgeons and surgical oncologists support the use of endoscopic resection for benign lesions, or at least a first look by one of us uh, when they are referred a patient for surgery. So uh, finishing up right on time. So best practices, what should we embrace? Uh, so we wanna utilize one of these endoscopic classification systems. We wanna use the right equipment. We wanna resect the, the, col the polyp the proper way. We want to prevent adverse events. And again, when it comes to clips, the evidence supports closing large defects in the right side. Consider adding cold snare polypectomy to your practice. And to prevent recurrence, we want to snare or resect off visible residual tissue. We can use avulsion in tissue that can't be snared or resected easily. And we can consider snare tip soft coag to ablate the resection edge. We want to avoid starting an EMR if we can't we don't think we can complete it. We want to avoid ablating with APC, large areas of residual or unresected tissue, no excessive biopsies, no tattoos close to or within the lesion. And again, we would advocate sending large colon polyps uh, to an advanced endoscopist uh, prior to surgical evaluation. So I thank you very much and uh, more than happy to take any questions. Chris, hi, it's Randy Steinhagen. Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. And I'd just Thank like you. to echo what you just said. It's been my practice for many, many years.
that whenever I get referred a patient with a polyp for resection, I send it to one of you guys first. You have one coming next week, in fact. Yep. From me, uh, that uh, and the vast majority you're able to remove, and the patients don't need surgery. And I think that, and first of all, thank you. And and I think part of the success of the endoscopic program we have here is that we have the support of you and your group and the rest of the surgeons. And I and I and I think that 20% uh, number that those two last studies showed is about right. I would say about 20% of the time we go in there with the best of intentions and we either see a large benign polyp that we don't think we can resect safely or completely, or we see something concerning and we tell the patient, listen, I may not be able to prove that there's cancer there, but based on these classification systems, there's a high chance there is and you'd be better served by a a surgical resection. I agree. That's about the number I thought also. My question, you, you said that even with the use of clips on large polyp beds, you can still get delayed bleeding. Does the presence of the clips make control of that bleeding more difficult if you do have to go back? It's a great question. Um, So there's an art to clipping uh, and it is is actually very difficult. Um, You can imagine if your resection bed is behind the fold or or in the ileocecal valve or something like that, um, you may not be able to get that right angle that you need to place that clip where you want it. And yes, Placing clips does interfere with your ability to place more clips. Um, you know, some, some of these large resection sites may require eight or 10 clips, and sometimes you're picking and choosing where you can put them. The other thing that is worth, so, so yes, when you go back in, you may, not be able to, you may not be able to access the bleeding site. That hasn't been my experience. Usually you see the clot or the visible vessel, uh, but often between the clips. Uh, but the other, the other important point to know is uh, if you're not careful in placing clips, you can actually cause bleeding during the procedure, cause a perforation during the procedure if those metal tangs get caught in the resection bed. So it, it does take some practice. Chris, Chris, how do you, yeah. what do you, what's your protocol for handling anticoagulation after these complex polypectomy. So many of our patients are taking aspirin or NSAIDs or Eliquis or Coumadin. What do you, what's your protocol? So obviously we will, we will not do these on anticoagulation. So whatever the anticoagulant is, it gets held in the appropriate time, depending on the drug. Plavix five to seven days, Eliquis 48 hours. Uh, the guidelines are very vague about how to restart this. It always, they always say restart it when it's safe whatever that means. So it's really best clinical judgment. Uh, if it's a very high risk patient, we, we actually never make the decision of how to manage an anticoagulant. If patients on an anticoagulant, we always have the patient discuss this with their cardiologist or their neurologist, um, and we use their guidance on what to do. If the patient has a very low risk, if they have a AFib and a low CHAD score, um, we, I will not have a problem restarting their coagulation maybe three or five days after the resection. The patient is at very high risk for a complication of holding their anticoagulant. Sometimes you have to restart it the next day or that night. Um, and in those cases, I will try to clip close those lesions. But, you know, again, there's no guarantee you can do that. Uh, it is a bit of a bugaboo. You do the best you can and you use best clinical judgment. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. That was a great talk. I Thank you, Jerry. Much- I feel much better staying at home now that you're there. (laughs) Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. What What are your take on some of these newer techniques? Do you Do you still, you know, have you adopted any of them uh, before you retired? Well, let me tell you that I don't clip anything. I didn't clip (laughs) anything. And if if you look at the poll paper that you quoted in the same issue of Gastro is a paper from the VA that says you don't need to right. So, you know, you, you, you can take one or the other, but I, I don't clip. I didn't show that paper because it was not, they did not reach, uh, they, they did not reach, uh, they didn't power it appropriately. They didn't reach the number of patients to power it appropriately. So I didn't show that for that reason. Uh, but yes, it did not show so, it. But I think in general, your talk was terrific. And thanks very much for putting all this together for all of us.
Well, coming from the master himself, that's high praise. So thank you. <laughs> I think we really, we really have to promote the cactus program. Right. Um, you know, I don't know how, maybe you guys already have plans for that, but, but this is so incredible that, you know, you're the second highest, you know, enroller in these studies. I mean, you know, it's, it's a major, we're a major center. So well, we I have think to think it, about I, marketing that. It, it was I think it out during this right. presentation about the cactus program. <laughs> Again, it's a, it's a testament. I mean, not only to Satish and Nikhil for the outstanding uh, skills they have, but it's a testament to the trust that our faculty, uh, both voluntary and full-time and our surgical colleagues uh, have entrusted with us. So, um, as I said, I, you know, I, I'm a pancreas guy half of the time, but large colon polypectomy has become like my, one of my most favorite procedures to perform. It's very satisfying, uh, both just from a technical standpoint, but it's also satisfying for patients and referring physicians uh, when you are able to avoid a, a partial colectomy for some of these, for some of these cases. Hey guys, hi, it's Asher. I'm sorry I was unmuted. I'm actually on vacation. I just was, uh, I just want to dive in and hear Chris and how he's sort of continuing this revolution and keeping Sinai at the forefront. I just, the parallel to me is when Henry Janowitz came and a singular figure could really change the world, being present, everybody that followed was thanks to Henry Janowitz. The world would be a different place. And right now, I think we could appreciate with you here and what you're building, the world would not have come to this place if it wasn't for Jerry. The world would be a different place, not just the Sinai world, the whole world of colonoscopy, polypectomy, the thousands of doctors that he's touched, and then the tens of thousands of patients, this exponential multiplier effect. I just can't ever stop thanking and thinking of Jerry. Again, Jerry, you made it so possible. There's no replacement for what you've done in history. So, so thank you again. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Jerry, come back. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, thanks for a wonderful talk. It was terrific. Thank you very much. Well, you guys know how to reach us if there's any questions. I thank you again and uh, enjoy the summer. <laughs>